Taylor. I'm Nikki Strong, and this is V. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Ana Mateo brings us words and their stories. She discusses an English saying about horses. Then, Kelly Jean Kelly presents the next part of our series on America's presidents. This week, LBJ. But first, the Higher Education Report. Valerie Doe of Vietnam is in her third year of college at Miami University in the Midwestern U.S. state of Ohio. The school has about 19,000 students, including about 1,000 international students. The small city of Oxford is pretty in the autumn and spring. But Miami University is definitely not in Florida and not close to any ocean beaches. The University of Miami is in Coral Gables, Florida, and about 15 kilometers from the famous beaches. Doe only found out after she was accepted that the school she had applied to was the one in Ohio. Some international students and those who work with international students say these kinds of mistakes are common. For example, one international student remembered being confused by the difference between Washington, D.C. and the northwestern state of Washington. Doe recently got attention from news websites such as Insider and the Daily Mail after telling her story on the social media site TikTok. Doe often uses TikTok to discuss her experiences as an international student. Earlier this year, Doe made a video about her discovery that Miami University was in Ohio, not Florida. About two million people watched it. I didn't realize it was in Ohio until I got the acceptance letter, she said. I basically went through the whole application process without knowing it's in Ohio. Many commenters offered sympathy that she was going to apple orchards instead of beaches this autumn. But in a follow-up post, she said she was happy with her experience in Ohio. Doe said she went to Miami for a number of reasons, including a good financial aid offer, the vibe of the school, and the business program. Dan Sinatar works with international students at Miami University. He and his colleagues help students like Doe feel comfortable once they arrive on campus. He helps to set the expectations of what it is like to live in southwestern Ohio before they arrive. He said some international students worry about how they can find food they are familiar with. So the office tells them about food stores with products from around the world. But other issues are more complicated. You know, uh, race and ethnicity is like a, a big topic in the U.S. and obviously, you know, impacts how people might engage with you. But there's many international students who might be coming from a, a country culture where they don't have these issues. The school has peer orientation leaders who help new international students get comfortable. Doe, in fact, is one of them. Sinatar said it is difficult to move across the world for school. For many international students, it is their first time living away from home, he said. Sinatar said that he and others at Miami often hear students discuss the Ohio and Florida confusion. One reason for this, he thinks, is that the international students often work with education agencies that help them apply to colleges. Arkar Chen is from Myanmar. 
He attended college in Los Angeles and now works for a computer software company in New Jersey. The agency probably thought she knew she was applying to the university in Ohio and didn't think to tell her that, Chen said. He said he did not use an agency and as a result, he was more prepared for his time in Los Angeles. However, he still had some surprises. Chen noted that Myanmar is a poor country, and he did not expect to see so many people in the U.S. living in poverty. In pop culture, when you mention L.A., you know, people think about Hollywood, the beach, and stuff like that, right? And I saw uh, the good images. But in reality, it is not so much different. I guess you could call it a culture or shock. Chen said it would be smart for international students to think about choosing an American university close to where family or friends live in case the culture shock is too strong. Another former international student is Christian Cao from Vietnam. He currently lives in Toledo, Ohio, close to the border with Michigan. He is an engineer who works with robotic systems in the automotive industry. He had not heard of Doe before the recent stories. He said he did not think her situation is very common for international students in 2023, but he understands how the confusion could happen. He agreed it is still possible that not everyone would know there is a Miami University in Ohio. By the time Doe understood Miami was in Ohio, Cow said, she already got accepted. She already got the scholarship. It would be a waste of time and money trying to find another university. But as Cow said, maybe it's not the life she expected, but it is not bad at all. She's making friends and still making progress. Cow said a student's college experience depends on what they are hoping for after they graduate. In his case, he was interested in studying engineering, so he did not mind that Toledo, Ohio, did not have a big nightlife. If you're a person like me, I don't party at all, Cow said. I just made friends and spent most of my time doing what I wanted to do at home. Ohio would be a great place for me. Cow said... Life in Vietnam and other Asian countries is very different from life in the U.S. Young people spend a lot of time studying and living at home. When you move to America, you break out of your shell, he said. You experience a lot of new things, and it's a big step up from your regular life. Cao went on to say, It doesn't matter where you are. You could be at a small university in Alabama. It's just a huge step up in terms of learning and adulting. Sinatar of Miami said one way students can learn about life in America is through the school's program of matching international students with American families. He said local families who want to meet people from other parts of the world can sign up to spend time with the students. They attend events together on campus and visit American homes. Cow said he could see how that kind of activity might be more appealing in Oxford, Ohio, than in a city such as Dallas, Texas. Dallas has a large international community, Cow said. Sometimes, Sinatar said, there are these really deep relationships that are formed. Sometimes the international students have said, yes, I look at these people like an aunt, uncle, or grandparent. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Jill Robbins. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On today's show, 
we will be talking about an animal that is as impressive and beautiful as it is useful. The horse. Today's expression is straight from the horse's mouth. Straight from the horse's mouth is about the way we get information, and with this expression, that means directly. When we hear something from the source, we can say we heard it firsthand. It is coming from a primary source. When we use this expression, we sometimes drop the word "straight." So, if you hear something from the horse's mouth, you hear it from the person who has direct personal knowledge of the information. For example, a coworker of mine, Andrew, likes to play the piano. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth. I really like to play the piano. Thanks, Andrew. The opposite of this expression would be through the grapevine. That is a very indirect way to get information. Now let's talk about origin. Experts are not sure how this expression started. However, there are two common explanations. One traditional explanation is about buying horses. Before buying a horse, a possible buyer would look into the horse's mouth. This is because you can tell a bit about a horse's health and age from its gums and teeth. Another explanation involves horse racing. At the horse races, people often talk about which horses will win and which ones will lose. The most valuable opinions are from the people who know the horses the best, the riders and trainers. Since you can't ask the horse, these people are the next best thing. Straight from the horse's mouth suggests the most knowledgeable source of information. So this expression can also mean from a reliable source. The information is coming from a trustworthy person. It may even be the definitive source. Meaning the best authority. Now let's hear the expression used in another example. Hey, guess what? Stella is moving to Toronto. She's so excited. Are you sure? She just bought a house a year ago. She told me herself last night over dinner. I just can't believe it. I mean, she also just got a promotion and a raise at her job. It doesn't make sense. Well, whether it makes sense or not, that's what she told me. Maybe you misheard her. I didn't. I heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Stella's. And that's all the time we have on today's show. If anyone asks you where you learned this expression, you can tell them you heard it straight from the horse's mouth from VOA Learning English. Until next time, I'm Anna Mateo. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Lyndon Johnson. He was the vice president under John F. Kennedy. Many Americans recognize Johnson from a photograph of his swearing-in on November twenty-second, nineteen sixty-three. Kennedy had just been shot during a visit to Dallas, Texas. Johnson and his wife also were visiting the city. After doctors announced that Kennedy had died, the Johnsons were taken to the presidential airplane. There, Johnson took the oath of office as president. 
men wearing suits look on, while three women stand around him. His wife, Lady Bird Johnson, is at one side. Former First Lady Jackie Kennedy is at the other. She is still wearing clothing covered with her husband's blood. The judge who is administering the oath, Sarah Hughes, stands in front of Lyndon Johnson. She holds a prayer book on which Johnson places one hand and swears to follow the Constitution. The photograph showed the American people that the federal government could and would continue in an orderly way. But Johnson's position was difficult. Many people were shocked and in mourning for the assassinated president. Johnson promised to continue many of Kennedy's reforms. He went on to use the public sympathy for Kennedy to pass additional legislation, especially in the area of civil rights. In the next election, Johnson was elected president in his own right. But as the conflict in Vietnam increased and some Americans rejected Johnson's reforms, he found his position difficult again. Lyndon Baines Johnson was born in Texas, where his family had lived for generations. A town called Johnson was even named after his relatives. Lyndon was the oldest of five children. His mother was a teacher and writer, and his father was a farmer and political leader. In time, the Johnson family experienced financial difficulties. They had little money to give their children much of an education, but Lyndon was able to attend a teaching college. Johnson excelled as a teacher. He also learned from his students. Many were even poorer than he was. They also faced discrimination because they came from Mexican families. Johnson promised to help them. But he found he could do more to improve people's lives as a politician than as a teacher. He volunteered for some political campaigns, became an aide to a member of the United States Congress, and in time became a member of Congress himself. Along the way, he married a woman named Claudia Taylor, but everyone called her Lady Bird. They went on to have two daughters. Johnson served for 12 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. In 1948, he was narrowly elected to the Senate, becoming one of the two senators from the state of Texas. From there, Johnson rose quickly. He took on increasingly important jobs in the Senate. By 1954, he was the Senate Majority Leader, the Democratic Party's top spokesman in the Senate. The Senate website notes that the person with that job needs to be able to work well with others, especially members of other parties. Historians also note that Johnson worked very hard and was always prepared. A well-known biography of Johnson is called Master of the Senate. The book describes Johnson as extremely ambitious, sometimes cruel, and often willing to praise others to get what he wanted. At the same time, he could be very concerned about other people's well-being. In other words, the picture of Johnson is a complicated one. In 1960, he competed against John F. Kennedy for the Democratic presidential nomination. Johnson lost that race but the party asked him to be their vice presidential candidate instead. Johnson agreed, not knowing that in a little more than three years, he would enter the White House as president.
After being sworn in, Johnson used his political experience in the Senate to pass a number of reforms. They were aimed at carrying on, in his words, a war on poverty. The new laws created health care and education programs. They also used federal money to make food less costly for some people and to train workers for jobs. Johnson also continued the work Kennedy began by signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The act made segregation because of race, religion, or national origin illegal. The Civil Rights Act also made it illegal for employers to discriminate against someone because of race, religion, national origin, or gender. The reforms had their critics, then and today. But in the presidential election of 1964, Johnson won by the widest margin of popular votes in American history. Historian Kent Germany says that vote gave the Democrats a rare opening to pass a comprehensive liberal program. Johnson had a name for such a program. He called it the Great Society. He said the United States should aim not only to be a rich and powerful society, but also to end poverty and racial injustice. Johnson followed his earlier reforms with others. They sought to prevent crime, reduce pollution, support the arts, make roads safer, and protect American consumers against bad products. His administration also created an immigration policy that valued family members, skilled workers, and refugees. Johnson also signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It sought to lift the barriers that had long prevented African American men and women from exercising their right to vote. Later, Johnson removed legal discrimination in the process of buying and renting homes. Together, these actions have linked Johnson to the civil rights movement in the minds of many Americans. Yet, Johnson is also strongly linked to another part of U.S. history, often known simply as Vietnam. Earlier presidents had ordered U.S. military action in the conflict between North and South Vietnam. Since 1950, Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy had slowly increased the American intervention. Their goal was to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. President Johnson continued Kennedy's policies. He also received the support of Congress to do whatever was necessary to protect U.S. forces and prevent further aggression by North Vietnam's communist government. Yet, when he was a presidential candidate in 1964, Johnson promised not to increase U.S. involvement and send young Americans to fight in Vietnam. The opposite happened. Over the next four years, Johnson called on hundreds of thousands of additional U.S. troops to fight on the ground and in the air. The North Vietnamese fought back, both on the battlefield and politically. In time, the American public withdrew their support of the struggle and their support for the president. By early 1968, Johnson had become deeply unpopular with voters. His party lost seats in Congress, and Johnson lost his ability to persuade lawmakers to support the measures he proposed. In addition, 
the U.S. economy was showing signs of weakness, partly because of the costs of the conflict in Vietnam and government spending at home. As the presidential nominating process began in early 1968, Johnson was permitted to seek another four-year term, but he announced that he would not seek or accept his party's nomination. Shortly after, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed. Angered by his murder, people in more than 100 cities rioted. Then, in June, John Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, was also assassinated. Kennedy had been competing for the Democrats' nomination for president. His death and Johnson's withdrawal added to the divisions in the Democratic Party. Several groups gathered to protest at the party's nominating convention in Chicago. The meeting ended in violent clashes between protesters and police. By the time Johnson left office in January 1969, his party had lost control of the White House, and many Americans believed the country was in disarray. After he left the presidency, Johnson returned to his home in Texas. He wrote his memories about his White House years and made preparations for his presidential library. But he did not live much longer. He died in 1973, hours before the U.S. involvement in Vietnam officially came to a close. Johnson was a complex person, and his image in the mind of many Americans is just as complicated. His policies opened new paths for many people, but also led to years of death and destruction in Vietnam. As a president, he acted powerfully and often independently, and succeeded in passing an unusually large number of reforms. But he also failed to persuade many Americans to accept some of those measures. Supporters of the free market especially strongly rejected the government controls Johnson enacted. Even some in his Democratic Party, which Johnson had controlled for years, lost faith in him. In 1964, anti-war activists changed his campaign slogan, All the Way with LBJ. Instead, they said, Part of the Way with LBJ. And by 1968, they were saying, Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English Podcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.